It is a worldwide phenomenon. We've been told that they have cases in Africa, in Europe, in Australia, pretty much everywhere there's man, you have cases of lycanthropy or shape shifting. Nathan, Luke, welcome back to Blurry Creatures. Welcome back. How you feeling, Luke? Pretty good. Pretty good, Dude. man. New dad. New dad. New dad. New dad. Hernia surgery. It's been a fun little uh, <laughs> few weeks here. You're just putting all that personal info out on the podcast. Hey, I'm you proud know. of you. Hey, I'm an old man now. What, I got nothing to hide. Luke's warming up, guys. He's getting vulnerable. <laughs> Sharon, sharing his heart. That's right. Tin Man has a heart. Uh, barely. Yes, <laughs> I'm the I'm the emo kid. You're the uh, I got to get you to warm up. Have I have I cracked have I cracked that that heart of yours after a hundred and something episodes? Dude, it was cracked early on, Nate. Did uh, I remember early on you were like a little skeptical of the alien stuff and? Oh, I'm still much more skeptical I think than you are. But yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I had I just had all these hours of listening to weird stuff. Sure, sure I was sure. way more prepped for what was coming at us. Not, I mean, it was still a wave, but I was just sometimes I'm like, I wonder what Luke's thinking right now. <laughs> Well, you know, dude, I, I've heard this, but I don't know if he has. Well, you know me, like I, I love, I love docs and podcasts. Sure, I love to sure. learn. So that's maybe the coolest yeah. thing about this is not only, well, not only is it is it fun, yeah, but I feel like I get to sit and learn, and mm-hmm. and that's been the really the, part of the amazing and doing it with a biblical, you know, worldview and and from a perspective uh, of you know of and through the Bible, I think has just been just the coolest experience to, to just to learn and to, to ask questions, right? I mean, that's what we're supposed mm-hmm. to do. We're supposed to ask questions, I think, and, and define why we believe and what we believe. And this has been, you know, it's been an experience doing this. So, you know, yeah. I don't know how far, I don't know what there, where there is, particularly speaking, but coming along. There's a fine line. And I think a lot of people get, get mad if we get close to the line or we go over the line or we cross the line. Everyone's got their line. Right. Of what's too blurry or too weird, too strange. But I mean, we can't say thanks enough to you guys out there. Luke and I had a we had a conversation this morning actually, and we figured out that we were. I just looked. We were, we made it in the top, one hundred, of all podcasts in America this week, which is just mind blowing. And I don't think either of us ever thought we would even crack the top two thousand. You well, know, I don't think we ever thought we, that that was even <laughs> possible. Part of what we were doing, yeah. I mean, this was kind of. This has been a passion passion project, right? And it's, yeah. It's uh, super cool to see the, the community that that has grown out of this, and just kind of where this has gone. I mean, I really think it's a lot. Mm. It's a lot bigger than we are, and you just mm. got to listen to our voices. So, oh, they like you. They like mm-hmm. you, Luke. You well, got, thanks, you got a good. You got some good resonance in there. Mm. Turn the bass down Deep. in that car Deep. now, huh? <laughs> I mean, you make me scared when I stand next to you. Luke's a giant, guys. We uh, talk about giants a lot on the show. You stay next to Luke, and you get a little mostly, afraid. Mostly gentle. He's a gentle giant. He would be, huh? Yeah. So we get the show started or what? <laughs> it's like, stop talking about me. Stop talking about me. No, but seriously, I want to say thanks. If you want to support the show, support the podcast, blurrycreatures.com slash members. It's been a crazy year for both of us. Everything from, I don't know, just personal stuff coming at us to... Luke's a dad now to, you know, venturing off on this is what I'm doing. I'm podcasting now. And your membership, you know, is is what we're riding on. So if you want to become a member and sponsor the show, help me uh, take care of my family. Is that too is that too desperate? No, no. it isn't at all. All right. Yeah, blurrycreatures.com slash members. Become a member of the show. We do chats. You get exclusive content. You get bonus episodes early episodes you get to get on these chat apps like discord facebook and we talk to you we respond to you and yeah the member the the memberships is what we do here and we love hanging out with you guys and if you haven't been able to taste the community here on blurry creatures you got to try it you guys are the best uh drink deep it always goes down smooth nathan and this episode is actually inspired by a member of the show we have a spreadsheet you can put on guest suggestions and this episode is one of those so 
Not only do members make this happen, you guys really influence the show way more than you think you do. Right. So, so become a member, support the show, come to the members' chats, be part yeah. of the members' groups, maybe even join a blurry Bible study. Those are happening, Nate. <laughs> Aside from what we're, we didn't plan it, we, we don't, don't run them. But there is a really amazing community that blossoms. You know, people that are are seeking the truth um, alongside mm-hmm. what we're doing. Thankful for the members. Thankful for the people that sponsor the show. Give us give us good tips and leads to well, who's the next blurry guest on Blurry Creatures. And if you're pastor, pastors are shouting out Blurry Creatures from stage. Sure. People are sending us photos all over the world. Merchandise is rolling. People snapping shots of their T-shirts all over the place. Yep. Man, we can't say thank you enough to what the show has become. That it's just two knuckleheads asking questions, basically in our underwear in the basement. And now, doing karate. for some reason. Eating guacamole. Yeah. We're still doing that, but we're a top 100 podcast, Luke. That's How right. do you feel? Feels good. That's right. Even you can start a podcast in your underwear and get to the top. Believe. Believe in Bigfoot and believe in your podcast, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Actually, don't believe, according to John. No. Know that Bigfoot is out there. Right. All right, I'm going to stop talking now. Let's get John on the show. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop that's just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Thanks for coming back on the show. I, 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 there was so much good stuff in our last interview with you. I'm sure it'll all come out again. For those listening, we recorded, I think it was a little over an hour episode, and mysteriously the audio was gone, missing. And I went back and looked at it, and I don't know what happened, but it didn't It didn't record. So we're double recording today. Hopefully we get, we get all this on. But, John, welcome back to Blurry Creatures. We kick it off, we talk about Bigfoot, and I think you know what we're going to ask you, because we did last time. We always ask people at the top of the hour, what are your thoughts on Bigfoot? And tell us a little bit about yourself, too, whatever order you want to go in. But uh, thanks again for coming on the show. Well, we'll start off with the basis, who I am. My name is Jonathan Redbird Dover. I'm Native American. I'm also part Filipino. Was born and raised in Los Angeles, of all places and went to school out there. As soon as I graduated, I moved to Arizona. In 1980, I got on with the Navajo Nation Rangers. I didn't know what a ranger was, but I needed a job. I went in and they only asked me one question. What would you do if somebody threatened your life or the life of your family? And my answer to them was, I'll cut their ears off at uh, 300 yards with the 300 Savage. Hmm. And uh, they said, you're hired. (laughs) Uh, So come to find out that the guy before the two guys before me, one was beaten up rather badly and uh, tied up with a rope and his badge was pinned onto his rear. The second one came out, spent one day. They threatened him and his family. He loaded up his truck with all his equipment and parked it and sat at the chapter house and says, come and pick it up. I quit. Wow. Wow. So yeah. a pretty lawless area when I first got here. Uh, I've had three assassination attempts on my life. Wow. And uh, managed to sur- survive them all. So here I am. Dang. Well, hey, you know, 
that's that's how it goes, you know. You if it's easy, you know, you're not, you're probably not doing something right, you know. When you start doing working for God and trying to expose evil, things come at you. John, I love it. You know, the guy lasts a day, and you 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 what, you retire after thirty years. Thirty is that years, what you said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah thirty one years. It's amazing. That's that's phenomenal. Well, one day versus thirty one, years. Yeah, that's that's crazy. So three assassination attempts on your life, and here you are in blurry creatures, and we're excited to have you um, mm-hmm. because. We know one thing, and then uh, even previous to our last conversation, is that there's a lot of crazy and paranormal, unexplained phenomena that seem to happen in and around the Native American reservations and in places of the like uh, across you know across our country, and we also know in North America here. As Nate said, though, our first question for you are: What are your thoughts? On, and we always kick every show off, Nate, like this. What, what are your thoughts on Bigfoot? Uh, of course, there's no right answers; <laughs> only good answers, as far as we're concerned. Well, uh, hopefully we'll give you a good answer here. My personal experience with Bigfoot, and and I'm going to state this right up front, me and Stan do not like that term, uh, because belief is uh, to accept something without any evidence. You know, I mean, I'm talking about the evidence uh, in faith Mm -hmm. that, that, that you have, that you just, you accept it and you believe it. Whereas in our case, empirical evidence, evidence that I can take to court and testify to under oath is that this thing is real. Mm -hmm. We've tracked him. We've got measurements and pictures of tracks that'll measure 22 inches. Um, We've uh, uh, tracked him for miles, five foot stride from heel to heel. And if you're walking on stills, you can't walk miles uh, in a pair of stills and leave Mm. tracks like that. In order to make those tracks myself, uh, I would have to literally do the splits to make that kind of a stride. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll be honest with you, I can't do the splits. (laughs) So, uh, John, real quick, was that in Arizona where you were tracking? Was this on on the job when you were tracking Bigfoot? Yeah, Navajo Nation is is a big reservation Hmm. it is twenty seven thousand square miles or 17 million acres of land it is in part of north northern arizona in uh new mexico and also in utah southern Hmm. southern utah so uh there's a lot of ground to cover uh essentially if you went from flagstaff to albuquerque a lot of what's north of you is going to be reservation land. So it would take me uh, about five hours to uh, completely cross it. Wow. That part of the country is beautiful. Like, I love Flagstaff. It kind of starts getting more woodsy. And right. And it's like you're, you're in the desert forever, and all of a sudden you're like, where, where, where did this come from? It snows. You know? It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is wild. Yeah. I mean, I've camped there several times. I love that part of the country. Flagstaff is a beautiful town. Well, we have um, areas of desert and canyons. Part of the Grand Canyon is right next to the reservation. In fact, uh, all the way down to half of the Colorado mm-hmm. River, we have jurisdiction there. And then we run up into the higher plateaus, and then we get into the Ponderosa Pine Forest, Pinon Juniper areas. And uh, yeah, really good mule deer hunting, uh, elk hunting up there. Oh, yeah. So yeah, how many rangers are on on patrol and like on staff i guess you could say at any well, given moment when i when i first started we had 40 rangers uh covering the entire reservation wow um every year after i was there we lost funding because we're entirely tribally funded so at the end uh there were only about 15 14 or 15 rangers when i finished and they were still being cut up to a couple of years ago. I think there were only nine rangers. Wow, that's a, I mean that's a ton of, of of acreage per ranger. If you break that down per capita, that's like yeah. You need a UFO to cover all the distance. It's an impossible job. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. Right, right. I, I just uh, I just looked at it as a glass half full. Right. And you know, I figured, hey, this is great job security. 
you know, they, they can't afford to fire me. Right. Although they, they did, they did lay me off at the end. John, well, tell us about a couple of these times you say you tracked Bigfoot. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. if this happened, tell us about what, I mean, because I mean, how, how does that come about one and two, like, how, you know, what is that process? And then how, I mean, how does it end? It obviously didn't end up with you, you know, shaking hands with the big guy necessarily, but <laughs> um, you know, how, how does that, Usually those tracks just go missing. They just disappear. Are you, getting, are you like getting a call though? Someone's saying, hey, there's a you know, potentially a Sasquatch out here and, and and then you guys are going and tracking this thing? Or how does that how does that even work? And can you tell us you share maybe a story about about an incident like that? Well, our our calls are, are all through our dispatch and they're through individual rangers that have things reported to them. Let me take you back a little bit and digress. And uh, this is how we first got into this uh, investigation of paranormal cases. We had two rangers that uh, uh, they were both rookies at the time. And, and you have to understand these guys. These guys are jokers. Mm. Uh, they get out together and they got all their little private jokes and they're giggling and laughing all day long. And that's just how they are, right. you know, if, if you knew them. So grandma and grandpa reports that a Bigfoot walked up to their corral. As they're watching, they stepped over the corral, grabbed a sheep, tucked it under its arm and walked off again with it. So they're upset. Yeah. And and they know all the animals out there. They 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 don't speak English. They've lived out there all their lives. They know every animal. So they call and these two two jokers get sent out. Once they get sent out, they show up. And of course they're laughing and giggling amongst themselves and talking and and grandma and grandpa took offense to this and they thought these guys aren't being serious and they're laughing at us. In Navajo culture, uh, you have a lot of respect for your elders. And so they called our department director. And I like to say, grandma chewed them out as only a grandma can. <laughs> and uh, just, just ripped them upside one way and down the other. Yeah. So he called everybody in for a department meeting. And in our meeting, he's told everybody from now on, every single one of these cases is going to be investigated thoroughly, and it's going to be documented. Then he turned to me and Stan, and he says, and you guys, so we were voluntold, <laughs> uh, you guys are going to get the main cases, you know, the, the, the big cases out of this, and uh, you're going to do the investigations on them. So uh, we just looked at each other like, wow, uh, X Files, you right? Know? Yeah. And uh, we didn't know quite what to make of it, although it sounded interesting, and we didn't think too much about it uh, until a little while later. Uh, dispatch gave us a call, and they said that there were a lot of people up in the Shiprock area, thirty huh. people that had witnessed or had some encounter with Bigfoot. Uh, along the San Juan River. Wow. Wow. That, you know, it's funny. All I, all I can think about when you're talking about this is that famous scene from Butch Cassie and Sundance Kid. Remember when they're trying to get away? Have you ever seen that movie, John? Uh, yeah, I've seen part uh, most yeah. of it. <laughs> well, well they, they bring in the Native American tracker, and he tracks them, and he keeps tracking them, and they, they can't get away. And yeah. it's kind of incredible. It's an incredible scene, but uh, they were just constantly like going over rocks and stuff. So, how, so you're track. You said you tracked Bigfoot for several miles. Did you know the footprints disappear? Did you get close to some kind of domicile, some sort of nest, or well, when when you track, um, there there's a whole lot to tracking. It's it's not just looking in the ground and yeah. and like they show on TV. Um, in combat tracking one person is the guard with, with a, a carbine. Mm. The other person is tracking. So he can devote all his skills to that because you can actually walk into an, an ambush that way. Mm. It, you know, you may hit a, a clearing and that's a kill zone. So you box around it, staying in, in the forested part, come back around and pick up the tracks again. So you're not exposing yourself. In these cases, when you're tracking, you're actually developing uh, your own opinions and thoughts on what it is you're tracking and what their their mindset is, what they're thinking. Are they going through easy areas or are they going through tough areas, you know, through the brush and everything else? Uh, are they trying to lose you? Are they walking backwards? Are they turning around and 
looking at you mm. to see what your progress is. You can find all that out as you track. They may even zigzag. And once they zigzag a few times, you can determine that they're zigzagging, but they're still heading in this one direction. And the whole idea in, in a good tracking scenario, you're actually going to get around them because you know which direction they're heading and head them off at the pass, so to speak, and mm. ambush them and hopefully make them give up. So that's the, the purpose of, of combat tracking. I've personally tracked people for 15 and even up to 30 miles wow. through desert terrain. So um, I can say that, yeah, it's, it's effective. So in this case, we would lose the tracks occasionally. You start casting, you spiral out, or you have a grid pattern that you use to cover all the available ground. And you pick it up again, and you just keep going like that. Sometimes the ground is hard enough where it may have duff on it. Duff is the pine needles and stuff that build up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to be casting ahead to find, you might find some stones that got pushed into the earth. And you're going to key on those as, as weight. Every person that moves across the ground leaves some evidence of their passing. It's just up to you to find that evidence and interpret it correctly and then move on. Hmm. So, uh, so that's what we would do. And then we get to a point where we have what, they, what we call trackable ground. The ground is soft enough that if you were to other step, you'd uh, leave a track and the tracks disappear. Wow. And so we went the other direction and backtracked it from where we started to see where it was coming from. And same thing, you, you go through all this, it's very time consuming. And we get to a point in trackable ground where the tracks just started. Wow. So we think our supposition from all of this is that it's very possible that Bigfoot may be a multidimensional being, that he is coming through a portal mm. into our existence here or our frequency stopping for a little bit and then disappearing back almost like you're you're snapped back by a giant rubber band or something mm. the other thing that we've noticed is over a lot of years of doing these investigations we see a correlation in ufo sightings along with bigfoot sightings so back to the story we we get up to shiprock and we took six rangers with us to do this investigation they had gone to the local police department and telling them, hey, we, we've got all these sightings. Uh, we want you to come out and investigate. The lieutenant at the police department laughed at them and said, I wonder how much these people have had to drink. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and and that, that's what re was reported in the papers up there. So now the people didn't want anything to do with the police department, so they contacted the rangers. Yeah. So, you know, we covered the area with six officers. We had night vision equipment. We had forward-looking infrared systems and pretty much scoured the area. And each ranger was assigned to contact the families in their area and get right reports on the, the statements that they made. So at the end of this thing, we found foot tracks. Uh, we found passages where it had gone through. We found one place where it had literally in a swampy area picked up a huge log out of the muck and lifted it up and threw it to the side. And the, the Bigfoot guy uh, investigator that was with us that we had invited, he says, oh, it's, it's uh, looking for grubs mm. under the log. We found hair samples near a barbed wire fence that it had stepped over. Hmm. And we sent the hair samples off to uh, someplace in Colorado, and it came back unknown carnivore. Mm. Wow. Nate, this is, this is yeah. one of the best answers we've had. I mean, literally, like, you got a guy giving us evidence. I mean, <laughs> this to me, though, is, is the crazy thing, and you, got, you did this, is that we hear these things, Nate, like where the footprints disappear. Right. It mm -hmm. almost sounds like David Politis stuff too, with the missing four and one where these footprints just disappear. Mm -hmm. But with Bigfoot, and, you, and you got all, you've got expert trackers, you've got them using the equipment and UFOs. Yeah, and what people are supposed to be is like a gigantopithecus, right? This like just very elusive giant ape shouldn't be able to just to disappear and stop walking 
on the earth and then start walking somewhere else. Like that stuff doesn't really throws a lot of holes into the idea. This is a flesh and blood creature that full, lives full time in, in this dimension as crazy as that may sound saying that out loud. It makes so much sense. And, and I just, I love that. This is what, this is such a crazy cool job that you guys were out there tracking this thing. Yeah. You know, and putting all your police training and, and, and all the technology to work. Well, it's just, crazy that they let yeah. you do all that, to, yeah. to be honest. Like, that's like so many Bigfoot guys, so many of the Bigfoot dudes, that, that that's their dream, is to get paid to do what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> but believe it or not, we were assigned these cases. That's amazing. On our own. You know, we, we even been investigated hauntings, Bigfoot, UFOs, and the fabled uh, Navajo Skinwalker. Okay. Yeah. In all these cases, we have never voluntarily said, hey, let's go out and look for Bigfoot on our own time. Yeah. Or let's right. go to this haunted place and see if we can see a ghost. These were assigned cases, and mm. we took them as such. It's amazing. And how does that happen? Is there like enough activity that's, that's taking place for you guys to then get the call from the boss man? Like, okay, this is, this is reoccurring? Because if you think about, like you were saying in the beginning of the show, there's so much territory for you guys have to cover. You would think that maybe a Bigfoot thing wouldn't make it on the list of priority. But it sounds it stole, like, it sounds like a stole livestock, though. So then it becomes sort of like a, yeah. cri a crime was committed, right? Like an, it, for all intents and purposes, yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, we classified them because we didn't have anything in our in our number system. We had a, a four digit number for every case that we would take, and livestock predation was a number. We would also have a wild animal complaint. Uh, such as a cougar or a bear that was preying on livestock. Mm. And so a lot of these cases, because we didn't have anything to put them under, we would put them under, for Bigfoot, we'd put them under wild animal cases. Right. But we had numerous cases, and a lot of them were word of mouth, that people just heard we were doing it and uh, would contact us. Or police departments would say, hey, you know, Rangers, we heard, you know, this is going on and, you know, you might want to take a look at it, contact this person. So they were all through official channels. It's amazing, like you said. And for our work, it represented less than 1% of all the work we were doing. Mm -hmm. We were doing dignitary protection. Our group was called Special Projects. Both me and Stan were uh, SWAT team co-commanders. We had our own backcountry SWAT team. That's awesome. Uh, that was fully trained. So both of us are firearms instructors. So that took up a little bit of our time. I I'm trained as a technical accident investigator. I'm trained as an EMT basic. So you're basically like a, like a Navy SEAL that also does a little X-Files work on the side, it sounds like. It's, 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 that's, that's right. That's phenomenal. Uh, my, my original goal was to be on a Green Beret A-team. Mm. Hmm. out of high school yeah and to that end i i signed up i was supposed to go to the 173rd ranger hmm. battalion and then after that i was well airborne training to rangers and then i was hopefully to take the q course turns out that one of my rotc instructors was in the seven special forces and one of my academy instructors was in the fifth special forces so you know i got along with special forces types oh, yeah. uh, really good but i ended up going to school in flagstaff instead and uh, i just wanted to get out of the house so. yeah like we all like we all did <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were 18 right? years old right yeah well john i've heard the the green berets get called in many times for some of these cases they bring, uh, that's what i've heard too they bring them in and they're tracking disappearances people going missing and they don't they don't communicate with the locals they don't communicate with the park they just come in and then they leave yeah what do you think's going on there oh i think it's it's these cases are big enough they're drawing enough attention and you have to understand that the government is very very interested in this stuff we've had i'll say government agents we don't know who they are or who they work for, but they've showed up at our uh, conferences and our talks when, when we're speaking and they'll sit in the back with a clipboard, they'll take notes and then they'll quietly get up and leave before the uh, program's over. And so we take into calling them out and saying, you know, welcome any military or government uh, <laughs> agents that are here. You have to understand Indian tribes are not trusting of the government to start yeah with. i was gonna say do the feds and Plus, i mean how much do they can they come on your land and do anything or oh, sure sure the, the the fbi has jurisdiction in major okay. cases 
so you know they've they've uh, they can come on for for big things after some of our uh, incidents we've actually seen uh, helicopter flights mm -hmm. uh, fly over from the Gallup area or from Flagstaff and Stan lives near Gallup I live near Flagstaff so it just takes a matter of I carry a compass in my truck and I just take it out, shoot an azimuth on which direction they're heading to. Later on, I'll take a, a map and I'll scribe a line from where I saw them in the azimuth that they're heading. And it'll actually coincide with exactly where we were doing the investigation on a UFO case. Uh, whoa, that's not surprising so, so, actually at all, but... Yeah, so we know they're interested. What is the Bigfoot UFO connection in your mind? What is that? We suspect, or, you know, this is just thinking out of the box. Oh, yeah. So you have to understand that this is uh, speculation. And our speculation is that there may be a direct tie to UFOs, or UFOs could be opening a dimensional gate somewhere mm. uh, that these things are also coming through. Maybe the gate is is not just for the ship, but it appears in numerous places at the same time. So, you know, you have the famous case at Skinwalker Ranch, where one was seen a hole that opened up in the middle of the night with blue sky behind it. And a Bigfoot type creature crawled through it, fell to the ground and got up and walked off. Hmm. And this is when the Shermans uh, yeah. uh, still owned the ranch and, and they went out and sat out all night to see what was going on. So you have cases like this uh, that that kind of fuel that type of speculation. Did you get those calls? Did you get called anything like that? Well, we have an area uh, near Greasewood that is very similar. Uh, we've had incidents involving UFOs, Bigfoot, and skinwalkers, all in that same area. And interestingly enough, it's on the same longitude that skinwalker ranch is wow so you know there's some speculation there that uh as to ley lines and power grids and everything else yeah i mean on, just on our show luke i mean i feel like we've done several episodes on that part of the country specifically you know megalithic stuff you know up and down we talked about you know there's supposedly a bunch of stuff that was found in the grand canyon and it goes back to the canaanites Right, you and, have all the stuff in Chaco and in the Anastasi and all these different things that happen all, all in that same area, yeah. which is all really weird stuff. But John, you dropped like a little bomb on us and then they just kind of kept talking because <laughs> that's what you do. But I mean, you said you investigated UFOs, hauntings, and then, then you know the skinwalker. I wanted, you were trying to talk about it anyway, but I really wanted to ask you specifically because, because the skinwalker phenomena is very much like a, a Navajo thing for the most part. We'd love to have you just talk a little bit about that and then maybe some of your experiences because we haven't had, it's been talked about in sort of platitudes on our show, but we haven't really really dug into it. And it's funny you mentioned Skinwalker Ranch. I've actually been watching that show, which I think is also kind of fascinating, even though it's made for TV, that the, some of these weird things, like you say, these portals opening up and there's all this phenomena uh, and then somehow it's connected to the Navajo and or that piece of, actually the, the, that piece of land of, of which I know that is is some probably somewhat adjacent to a lot of the Navajo Nation that you that you patrolled. So we'd love to just to hear you talk a little bit about that and then maybe some if you have any stories of actually being on calls for skinwalkers, we we've kind of just scratched if anything just scratched the surface on any of that. And I think you were uniquely qualified having been a Navajo Ranger to talk about that. Okay. First off, I'll start with uh, something directly related to Skinwalker Ranch, which is that there's a uh, story that says that the Utes provided scouts for Kit Carson and uh, his cavalry when they were rounding up the Navajos. Now you'll hear a lot of stories. There, there's different takes on how this all occurred. The historical version that we hear in, in the history books today is that, oh, the Navajos were stealing. They were stealing horses and cattle, and they had to be rounded up and stopped. Well, come to find out that in 1864, actually 1863, a government military assayer was going through the reservation, and he looked at all the formations and says, there's gold out there. Mm. Now, gold had just been discovered in Prescott. 
So the government decided we need to get rid of those Navajos so we can mine up there without any conflict. And that's what caused the uh, roundup. Mm. Uh, they were taken off and, and basically forced marched to Bosque Redondo, about 250 miles away. It was kind of like our Navajo version of the Bataan Death March. Yeah. Hmm. So a lot of them died along the way. Afterwards, they found out that, hey, there's actually no gold up there because it's the wrong, the wrong uh, geologic formations. So they allowed them to come back. So the story is, is that the Navajos got together, the medicine men, and they cursed the land that the Utes were on and said, you're going to have skinwalkers now up there. And so that's the uh, romantic story. I had an opportunity to go on to Skinwalker Ranch uh, in one of the episodes and look at some petroglyphs and look at uh, what appeared to be, to me, a sacred site. Uh, that was set up by uh, the Utes or even prior to, you know, the Utes being there, maybe the Fremont. And um, I came to the conclusion that a lot of this strange activity has been taking place for hundreds of years, if not thousands mm -hmm. of years. And so the romantic story that Navajos cursed the Utes and caused all this stuff to happen I believe is not correct. Mm. Uh, I think that that thing's always been there. And, you know, who knows what they're going to find out. Uh, Bigelow Aerospace Research uh, actually owned that land prior to, and they researched it savagely. And at the end, everything's still classified to this day. This was just bizarre. And I've heard yeah. that. They don't, for whatever reason, it's all under lock and key, which makes you scratch your head a little bit, right? Like, yeah, that's, I mean, John, that's kind of what I brought up the, the sort of my, my point earlier about that area, because I think, I mean, it seems like on our show that all this stems from ground zero, you know, from the Holy Lands, these entities came, went all over the place, these Canaanites and these giants. And they, I think they taught the spiritual, these, these dark practices, this witchcraft to all the people all over the world, you know, whether it's in South America, whether it was here in America it came from somewhere, and I think it came from whenever the Israelites were pushing these entities, these giants, out of places like Canaan, and they, because we find evidence on our show that they were they were building the same stuff all over the world, and there's all these connections. Like, how could this group of people be building the same thing as this person, these people, all all the way across the world, especially at that time? So I wonder if some of those areas they've been defiled by these entities that got there long before the native americans were there you know and it's just sort of this inherited story but that's my thought that's what seems to be going on when the more we do our show i don't know if you have if you have any of those thoughts but we we talk about the giants a lot on our show well in navajo history their their oral history the oral history talks about giants being in the world it appears to me that the Navajos themselves say that they came through several different worlds to this world, which is considered the fourth world. So the first world was a world of darkness. They come up into a second world that has a, a aquatic life and land. And then they come into a third world that has insects. And then now in the coming into the fourth world or the shining world, which we're in now, they actually give a description. They say a whole opened up in the sky. And so the Navos took a couple of what they, they call them reeds, but they sound like they're some type of wood that they leaned up into the hole and they climbed up into this world and emerged uh, in, in the place of emergence or uh, Dineta, which is up in the Four Corners region. So they've come into the, this world. Yeah, it sounds like a like a stargate or a, or a, a portal almost, right? Like a hole opening. Yeah, that's right. So, but in in the previous world, they had giants described, mm. and in fact, uh, you have the twins uh, called the giant slayers. So you know they were actually going out to kill these things. Oh, yeah. um, so you know there there is a, a long long history. Yeah, there's lots of petroglyphs. It looks like they're killing these things. Right. You know, and they look they look massive, and they look strange they almost look alien sometimes too 
Now we get into this world and medicine men that I've talked to have told me that even back to the 1860s or no, I'm sorry, the 1600s, when Navajos first got horses from the Spanish that came through, they were using horses to get around and they talk about using horsehair lariats. And in the uh, probably early 1800s or even maybe late 1700s, there are stories about Navajos encountering Bigfoot. And in one case up in Coyote Canyon area north of Gallup, they surrounded one with horses and roped it with their horsehair lariats. And they said it, it once it was roped and strung up between all these horses, it sat down in the middle and it started to speak Navajo to them. And the story goes that it says, if you, I'm just trying to go through to Mesa Verde. And if you take me up there, I promise I will not return. So they rode with it between them all the way up from, from New Mexico area into Colorado and let it go up there. And it started to speak Navajo. Was it a Bigfoot or a giant? Well, they're, they're saying uh, a Bigfoot, but you have to understand that the Navajo language is a very precise and descriptive language. And so what they're talking about is something that's huge and hairy. Hmm. Hmm. That's, that's crazy. So, you know, this is one of the first incidences that we have. So back to, uh, back to the skinwalker thing. Uh, let me describe to you, because there's a lot of false information going on, TV being what it is, and the internet being what it is. Uh, if you look at the internet, you'll see pictures of Kachinas, you'll see pictures of uh, Navajo medicine men yep. or uh, dancers wearing Yebiche outfits. These are depictions of various gods that the people have. And to put the moniker Skinwalker over them just because they look weird is kind of like saying, well, the Pope wearing his vestments are, is, is an evil uh, satanic being, you know, so very disrespectful. And I've had my say with some of the, some of the TV shows uh, mm. about that. The Skinwalker is somebody who has gained the knowledge of shape-shifting or shape-changing this shifting is done through uh, a series of chants and ceremony. We don't know what that is uh, that they're doing, but apparently it works. Now, the skinwalkers are real people. They're, they are not an avatar. Uh, they're not somebody in a cave that's directing this thing. Uh, they can be killed. Uh, I've actually had an uncle that uh, killed one. Wow. And um, he went to town and decided to go to the bar and brag to everybody while he was drunk that I uh, killed a skinwalker. Next thing I know, he's chasing his girls around with an axe, trying to cut their heads off. And he got put in a, uh, a home, huh. you know, mm. and uh, within a year he was dead. So they think that after bragging, you know, somebody heard about it and, you know, and they came and got their revenge, wow. but he had shot one that was trying to get in. Uh, he said it was a coyote trying to get into the sheep pen, shot it in the flank and uh, it ran off. And several days later, an old man up on the mountain that had long been suspected of this uh, died of a bullet wound in the side. Wow. These things use incantations and spells. All they need to change is the DNA of something. If they want to change into a coyote, they have the hide of the coyote they carry it in their backpack. They can use other animals. They can change into owls, into ravens, into whatever kind of animal that they have, the, the fur or the feathers. I've actually heard of one case where a woman was going down the road and she saw 
what she describes as a half man on top, half kangaroo on the bottom. It shook her up. She, she kept driving. And then she said she went to the local market later on uh, that week. She saw the same man behind the counter. Was he buying? Was he so, was he buying Uggs? Was that was he's carrying around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would think so. so That's wild. Um, That's wild. This is like what we hear on our show with Greek mythology. Did they have the same cantation ability, and then it's just rebranded? I only speak to Navajo yeah. uh, skinwalkers because that's where my experience lies. So I have empirical experience. There. Sure, sure. It is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, we've been told that they have cases in Africa, mm. in Europe, in Australia, uh, pretty much everywhere there's man, uh, you have cases of lycanthropy or shape shifting. Yeah. Uh, in the United States, yeah. we have uh, up in the, the Northeast, you have stories of the Wendigo. You have the rake. We understand that the Apache tribes uh, in southern Arizona have their version of a shapeshifter. So, you know, there's there's a lot of different tribes that that this thing, you know, goes along the same route. So there's always a uh, human being behind the shapeshifting. Though. Yes, yes. Now, in the case of Navajo shapeshifters, you don't just put in an application and say, I want to learn how to do this. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, there's two ways that you could be contacted. One is direct contact through a bunch of shapeshifters already that may approach you and they'll give you a choice, either die or pick somebody in your family that you care very dearly about to be sacrificed. And this is the only way you can gain that power. The other way is to come upon one of their meetings, a Sabbath, so to speak, and, you know, notice it or, or see it and be captured and be told you can become one of us or you can die. Wow. So, I mean, it's crazy. There's a human sacrifice involved in, 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 this, in this ritual. I mean, that, yes. That's, yes. That sounds about as dark as it gets. When you invest, do you investigate these things on, like on the, res, on oh, the yeah. reservation? And, and did you have any bizarre, I mean, I imagine they're all bizarre experiences, but do you have any note, like any interesting stories about it, about an investigation? Uh, yeah, we've, my, my grandfather was a, uh, Christian reform minister, but as part of his testimony, he said that he was trained from a very early age, probably around eight years old to be a Navajo medicine man. And he told me in talks that I've had with him, when you learn this stuff, you learn everything. Mm. You're not, uh, the way he put it, he says that as a medicine man, you have to have knowledge of how the curses are developed so that you can counteract them. Hmm. We've seen cases where people have been, the skinwalker will carry a piece, usually a piece of human bone, like a piece of the radius that's hollowed out. And they will pack it with something that's called corpse powder. This is uh, made from the corpses of dead people along with other various poisons. And they'll take this and, or even a reed and have it preloaded and blow it at you. We actually had a, uh, a guy come out with a film crew one time and um, we were sitting around a fire that we had built outside. 25 feet away was a whole gun. And as we're sitting there with the cameraman and the, and the producer and uh, me and Stan, a coyote walked between the whole gun and us and me and Stan looked at it. everybody looked at it. It just turned, stopped and looked and then trotted on over and down the rise. Me and Stan jumped up and we went running to see if we could see which way it went. And when we got there just a couple of seconds after it was gone. Hmm. Uh, shortly after that, the producer got sick. The doctors could not determine what was wrong with him. He stayed sick for a year and some months uh, uh, and almost died. Dang. And slowly, you know, made his way back. I've got another guy that, that we did investigation on that uh, also was, uh, he came out and hit a dog. His, his, that's a uh, Haas lore. And Haas uh, wrote a book about this. And he talks about 
going out in his, his yard and hitting this dog with a two by four. And he says, when he hit it, all this dust came up and the dog was mangy looking and had hair falling off and everything else. So he hit the dog, killed it. He says the dog fell over and, and urine came out. And so he goes in and tells his wife, uh, Haas is, is uh, Anglo yeah. and his wife is Navajo. So the wife says, show me, you know, which is typical, you know, yeah, I don't believe you, you know, prove it to me. And uh, he goes out there and the dog is gone. Mm. So later on, he became sick. He says he was literally vomiting out one side and crapping out the other, laying mm. in a pool of sweat. And his wife and a neighbor got him and carried him to the truck and drove almost 100 miles to see a medicine man. And the medicine man told them, he says, it's a good thing if you had waited another couple of hours, he would have been dead mm. and started doing a ceremony with him. And he came back. Wow. He, he was he was cured pretty. Uh, it was miraculous, the, the cure that they gave him. And so he talks about, you know, the effects of that kind of powder. And the doctors, again, couldn't find what was wrong with him. So uh, you see a lot of cases like this, and, and uh, the skinwalker can also appear as people. They can get your DNA, change into your shape, and approach people that you know. As you. And uh, as you. Wow. So uh, Navajo children at, from a very early age are taught you don't leave fingernail clippings around you when you're done brushing your hair take the hair out of your brush and burn it. Mm. You don't leave your uh, urine or your feces uh, laying out in the open. You cover it up. You don't leave sweaty clothes outside. Take them in and, and put them away, that That's kind wild. of stuff. And, and this is taught traditionally. And when you think about it, yeah, it all has to do with DNA. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, What's that's like half the, that's half the show. I mean, basically we talk about that since, since the beginning of this, but the more we we kind of barrel on, John, we're trying to figure out because a lot of people of faith they just slap demons. This is just demons on everything. But it sounds like these these creatures have a category. You know, it's more complicated. Like skinwalkers is is a completely. It's like sounds like you have to have some sort of satanic um, ritual in order to pull that one off. But Bigfoot doesn't sound like a skinwalker. No. It's a completely different creature. And. For most spiritual, you know, Christians and is, is our main audience. You know, they just have this very narrow view of what of what's going on. If it's strange, they just say oh, it's it's demons. But it sounds like demons are a specific creature too. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on all that because you've been doing this for so long. You have to have cataloged sort of a list of what these creatures are and and where they are on on the list and. I mean, plus you've also said you've investigated hauntings, which which a lot of people, to Nate's point, will automatically slap that with with it being demonic, and maybe it is. I mean, I don't know, but I know that that's also a very bizarre ph phenomena that it doesn't fit the same classification as Nate would say as as the skin watcher. It seems like it's shamanic. It's a, it's a shamanic ceremonial ritual thing that spell essentially that turns you into a shapeshifter, and then like, yeah, Bigfoot's different than that, and, and the UFO thing. But yeah, like. I don't hope I didn't. I hope I didn't take that one no, off the rails, Nate. No, but that's no, no. yeah. I'm curious because you did talk about hauntings. Well, one of one of the things that we do in a matter of course is that we do not ascribe any names to any of this. Even Bruce Lee one time said to look at a situation and name it. Naming it, making it a word, causes fear. Hmm. So we don't try to have a preconceived idea we will go in and we will investigate something all kinds of weird things happen and we just go on just like oh yeah that's that's normal you know one thing we found about hauntings is if you show fear you give it energy and it'll manifest even more so we just you know look at it and go oh yeah it's trying to get our attention no biggie so that's one of the things how we approach this and then we try to be as analytical as we can we're always looking for how did this happen why you know what are the the, the background behind it when we finish these cases a lot of times we'll we'll take a deep breath and you know go whoa you know yeah did we did that just happen 
You yeah. Know, did, did we experience that? And then we'll sit down and try to write up our reports as objectively as we can mm. and, you know, move on, on to the next case or on to whatever our next job is. So there, there is this idea of good and evil. Mm. These things have coexisted uh, for millennia. Mm -hmm. In Navajo, you have something called hojo, which is this sense of balance that every person should have in their life. Uh, in order to function properly, you have to have a balance. Mm. So if you have nothing but good, you're not in balance. If you have nothing but evil, you're still not in balance. Mm. If you're somewhere in between trying to balance the two out, it's almost like both are necessary. There's some mm. kind of point to it, although we don't have the the background or thinking to be able to decipher that. If you read the Psalms, you get that vibe. You know, David's constantly dealing with walking through the valley of the shadow of death right. and trying not to have fear, right? And the Bible's constantly trying to put that out in people's minds. Do not fear. Have no fear. And well, you, you hear about God creating the heavens and the earth, and you hear that there's an uh, angels and you find out there's a hierarchy of angels, mm -hmm. many different types of angels. And then we have angels that rebelled and get cast, cast down to earth. Interestingly enough, our depiction of Satan with this red guy, guy wearing a red suit with a tail and carrying a pitchfork with a couple of little horns, you know, usually cartoonish, right. is not the depiction of Satan. Satan would rival any other angel for his beauty yep. and his brilliance. Yep. And scripture even says, you know, be careful uh, about these false apostles because they'll come to you as an angel of light. So, you know, you, you have to, you know, you have to be judgmental. You have to, you can't just take it and say, okay, I'll just believe it. And here comes this shiny being and says, go kill all these people and you're going to go out and do it. It, it there has to be some thought process behind it and um uh, that's that's what we don't see so we we don't look at that belief system as um and and when i say that i'm not saying that i'm a sectic or agnostic or or whatever in in studying scriptures the crucifixion is something that takes place in time space dimension history it's mm -hmm. the cross was real. Mm -hmm. uh, the Roman soldier shoved a, a spear in, in the side of Christ. And he says water and blood poured out. When you see water and blood uh, separate in my EMT training, they told us that that's a sure sign of death. Mm -hmm. He's encased in, you know, about a hundred pounds of linen and air make spices ground up into a gummy consistency and wrapped up in this stuff and you know so how is he going to move in that right and you know the apostles come in and see that the tomb is empty and see the grave clothes lying on the slab he comes out and he takes a boulder the angel takes a boulder and in there's three different greek passages that describe it on a little hiero and apo what they're saying is that this two and a half to three ton boulder was literally picked up off the ground and threw up a hill. Hmm. And the Roman guard unit, which was a 16 man detachment in the first century AD, fell as dead men. They fainted. Hmm. And these were guys that were, you know, forum would guard and the other ones would lay with their heads in toward the center. Yeah. And they were, they were trained to protect six square meters of ground apiece against an invading army. There was a Roman seal put on the tomb, leather straps with clay packs. And if you broke the seal, it was automatic crucifixion upside down. So, um, yeah. you know, and, and the whole Roman government would come after you. This is why you see the Roman guard unit running to the priests and saying, protect us. But after that, you don't hear anything about them anymore. Mm. So I look at that as evidence. Mm -hmm. And same with uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus into the Apostle Paul. You can't historically disprove that it didn't happen. 
and you have a, a guy that gets his head chopped off at the mm-hmm. end for his faith. So there is definitely something to all this. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, John, like what you were bringing up a little minute ago was just this idea of like testing the spirits almost, you know? If Satan is is appearing to people as an angel of light, you know, we have to know who our Savior is. And we have to ask these entities because, like you said at the beginning of the uh, the episode, from the, from the very beginning was, you know, I don't I don't look at this like a belief. I know I had there's evidence that these creatures are real. That this stuff goes on, and after doing this show for a couple of years, I, I'm in the same camp. Like I I know Bigfoot's out there. I don't I don't even waste my time trying to debate it anymore. It just feels like what is it and how is it what's what's it doing. And that's my thought process. But I think we're getting to these these times, John, when we're going to have to ask these spirits because I feel like it's just the veil is thinning. Weirder stuff is happening. And if people listening to shows like this don't understand that you have to ask these things. If, if, if something presents itself to you, who's your father? Where, where do you come from? Who are you loyal to? You know, and I. Yeah, that's right. You have to be grounded. And if you're not grounded, what, what we've seen in my work is adventure seekers. Yeah. They they like that adrenaline. And you get to be what they call an adrenaline junkie, which is you have to have that high. Now, the opposite of having that adrenaline high is depression because it goes in a sine wave. So it never, you know, you have all this adrenaline. It never actually comes back to the middle. For equal, every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So you get a high, it goes to depression. And then you have to get that high again to to feel normal. And you keep doing that. You have to have more and more highs. And pretty soon you're taking more and more risks and then people die. Um, It's a law of diminishing returns, right? Yeah, it's less and less. Yeah, make a great point. You know, we've actually said that if people are going to a pair jump, you know, land-based jump off of some of these canyons that we have, they should be posting a bond that, uh, you know, for the cleanup, right. <laughs> uh, so to speak. Uh, we've had paragliders that have smacked into the ground and, and hang gliders that have gotten killed uh, because they, they want this excitement. And, and we're the ones that have to go in and, and find them and pick up the remains and, and put them in a body bag. So, uh, yeah. You know, now, John, I, I like what you said there. I want to go back real quick that like, I mean, being an investigator and laying out the case for Christ, you, you know, 500 people or more had an encounter with a risen Christ. Like you have, I, I just like the way you looked at that. Like the, it, it's just like your line of work. When we talk about the things that you've experienced, which, which far exceed like the normal into the paranormal space, you, you realize that there's, there needs to be metrics and, and things to sort of measure and evaluate this by in order to, to, to quantify it. Right. I like what you're saying with, with the grace for Christ, because I think I think people forget that yes, there's these things that happened that we know happened that we can lay out a case for, including the fact that that the risen Christ appeared to all of the apostles and at one point a group of 500 people or more, and they have the, we have these accounts like that that are measurable, and and I lo- I love that, and I love that that's what we bring this work to because we operate in this space of all this unknown, unexplained, and and Nate, we we're, there's not always a lot of hard answers, but but there's a lot of experiences. And so being to talk to someone like you that had that had to investigate from a you know, from a process driven job, really, you do procedural things to do when you investigate. I think it's fascinating. And you know, I know one of the things that you talked about too when we were doing this is that you had a lot of other crazy experiences. We talked a bit about UFOs. And when we talked from the top, you you'd said that you'd seen cigar shapes and disc triangles and orbs and well, you know, one of the things I wanted to get to before we let you go, of course, was to just talk a little about the UFO experiences because I think these all think these things all in a crazy way are connected. I'd love to pick your brain on that. We talked about Bigfoot and UFOs being connected. We talked a bit about Skinwalker Ranch and the and the idea of these, you know, e- even just portals. The idea that things come through, and we think maybe we can hypothesize that Bigfoot, one way or another, goes through or through a dimensional portal or a dimensional hole, whatever you want to call it. But you had a lot of experiences on the on on the reservation where you were called in to for UFO sightings and these, and I wanted to before, yeah, before we got too far in, I wanted to make sure I asked you about a few of those things because we cover that phenomenon. We, we've talked a lot, Nate, a, a lot on this show about what are they? And we're at a time now where the 
the government is admitting this. Like the government of, of all things, the, the, the organization that that seemed to have wanted to cover this up since the Roswell incident, you know, since things started getting out from underneath their the cap, is now saying, oh yeah, UAPs. We're just gonna name it something different, but yeah, they exist and we don't know what they are, and everything else is redacted and classified, right? But you had you had real investigations on the reservation where and experiences with UFOs, right? Yeah, we our first case actually we classified as the old man case, and in the old man case, uh, this this gentleman who's in his mid eighties, yeah, had had worked all his life uh, off the reservation and retired and came back. He's at home. His his wife and his daughter are uh, had gone to Phoenix, and he he's living out in the middle of nowhere sees uh, what looks like lights coming to his house. He doesn't have electricity. He doesn't have running water. You know, just just the normal situation for for majority Navos. And so he looks out the front window and says, I wonder who's coming. And what he sees is this big light flying over. And he's watching this thing and it circles his house. And as he watches it, it goes up on the hill uh, behind him. Uh, maybe about a quarter mile away, and a light's there. Uh, he said he doesn't know if it landed or if it's just hovering, but several things come out the bottom. Hmm. And they're, it looks like they're all riding on something, is, is his description. And they go down the hill to another house, which is about a half mile from his place. Uh, it's a relative, and then it goes back up up the hill, just glides up the hill again. And this is uh, an area with pinyon juniper uh, and a lot of brush. So then it comes down toward his place. And he's got a small blue healer pup, one of these crazy little puppies that's all gray, got the black spots all over it. When we first met it, it was trying to jump all over us and lick us to death. (laughs) And it starts barking and runs off toward where these things are coming down. And he hears the dog yell, yipe, you know, and he says it comes running back and lays down by the front doorstep, curls into a ball and doesn't move. So he starts feeling uneasy. He goes back inside. He says, next thing he knows out in the back of his house, he sees what he calls for, and in Navajo, there's no word for alien. So he's referring to them as four children. Hmm that are uh, walking around. Each one is carrying something in his hand. He calls it a flashlight. And there's a collimated beam about an inch in diameter. And one's blue, green, yellow, and red. And they're shining these things around like they're looking for something on the ground. And they got very interested. And he's got a bunch of uh, solar lights outside of his house. And they got very interested in these solar lights. And they would gather around one and, you know, kind of lean in to look at it. Uh, They were just fascinated by this thing. And he says the light would dim and go out. And then they'd all stand back and take a step back and the light would slowly come back on. And they'd lean in again. You know, he says they did this several times. So by this time, he's saying he says that these kids have big heads they have big black eyes, very skinny, and they're either wearing a metallic or white color suit that, that's pretty skin tight. And he gets upset and he says, what are these kids doing around my house at, at one o'clock in the morning? And so he gets he gets a dry cell flashlight, those old square ones, and, and goes out the front door and walks around the side of the house to go confront them. As he turns the corner into the back of the house, he tripped over the the steps going out the back and fell down. He says, as he raised his head up and looked up, he says, these things were in line, like they're sitting on something and going back up the hill and gliding without making a sound. Hey. It's wild. 
I mean, Pinion Brush, you can't, you don't glide up that hill. I mean, and you, if you if you're not familiar with that, it's 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 our, to our listeners. That's not that's something you can easily trans, transverse or or climb or glide. As, that's right. as, as John is saying, it's uh, quite the opposite if you're trying to get up that hill. It's weird, John, because so, we just did an episode on the Black Eyed Children, and this has sounds very similar to that. It sounds a lot like Grays too. I mean, you know, they kind of yeah. go back and forth. Those two. So and, they get they get back into this craft and and take off. Afterwards, you know, we go out and do the investigation. The dog comes out. He's jumping all over us. Uh, we had a team of uh, environmental people there with uh, dosimeters to get background radiation readings. And we wanted to find if that this craft actually landed and if there was a difference in radiation between the surrounding area and where it, where it landed or where it hovered. We couldn't find that location. However, they were dressing up in white Tyvek suits. One of the girls in the crew was a, a dog lover, and she's over there yelling at this dog, come here, come here. And we couldn't get this dog off of us. You know, it was just trying to lick us so, so much and had muddy paws. And uh, of course, if you're in a uniform, you don't want mud all over you. He saw the white suit and ran to the front of the house and curled up in a little ball next to the front door. Yeah. So we noted that we found unusual markings, kind of like if you took a coffee can and just pushed it into the ground one after the next in a line, we found markings like that with no footprints or anything else around it. There was another dog that was there that was a pit bull that had just had uh, pups. And this dog was on a big chain and it was literally trying to rip the chain out of the ground to get at us and tear us up. The, the old man told us that on that night, this dog went in the dog house and refused to come out and never made a sound. Wow. Fear. So at, yeah. at the end of it, the neighbors said that they had about six or seven small pups that were, you know, these little fuzzy, roly-poly puppies that are just little balls of fur that, you know, as they get out and start to walk, they're just tripping all over themselves and falling down and rolling around. Uh, they said that all seven of these pups disappeared that same night. Wow. So, you know, now we have the ominous music because uh, there obviously something nefarious was going on. Usually with predators, they'll leave hair, they'll leave, you know, blood. Uh, we checked the whole area and they were just gone. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing we hear all the time is it doesn't sound like an animal is the culprit, you know, especially with the missing 411 stuff. There's no evidence half the time. Yeah. And if they do find anything, they find it after the fact in a place they've already searched and it doesn't make any sense. And it's just this strange series of events that go along with a lot of these paranormal, everything from Bigfoot to UFOs. Is there things that you're not, that you're not allowed to talk about? I'm curious, you know, you, all those years. And obviously, you know, you're not, you're, if you haven't talked about it, Hey, you we're gonna tell us about it. But. It's not you're gonna tell us, but I mean, <laughs> is there a lot of stuff that just it's just too strange? It's too off the books that you're not legally allowed to talk about. Well, there one of the things that we never talk about is who the people are yeah. that had these encounters, and that's one of the things that we did out of respect that we guarantee people's anonymity, and that's why they come to us and want to talk to us. So that's that's a big, big number one. There are things that have happened to us that, that we don't talk about, personal things. Some of these things have followed us home. In Stan's case, he had a, a haunting case where over two nights and three days, uh, coins were what they call a porting, falling to the floor. They were hitting the walls. They were hitting people in the back. 64, 65 coins over three days. That appeared. They come out of nowhere. And they were just disappeared out of nowhere in in a building, in a locked building, uh, with the investigators. Wow. Each one was mapped out as to where it was in the room where it fell. Uh, it was photographed for evidence, and it was collected. Out of the sixty-five coins, they hit the walls, they bounced, they rolled, they spun, and out of sixty-five coins, they all ended up heads up. Six. Which is a statistical impossibility. Yeah, say statistically uh -huh. impossible. Yeah. And this same phenomenon, the support, uh, followed Stan home. And in one case, one of the investigators was standing in the doorway of, of his house. 
and a whole handful of coins fell over his head. And Stan says he was looking at them at the time, and he saw the coins materialize in the air and fall down. Wow. Yeah, what's your conclusion with that? What, what do you yeah. think that is? I mean, that's the thing. There's, there's so many of these strange stories that, that don't even sound made up. In a simplistic way, it could simply be something that's uh, saying, heads up, I'm here. Hey, yeah. <laughs> 65 times, you know, like, here I am. Mm-hmm. Heads up. Uh, yeah. One of the things that happened to Stan was that he was over at his brother's place, and they have one of these hanging baskets that have fruit in them these wire baskets yeah. that have three baskets and uh, there was uh, one that had grapefruits in it. And he says, as they were standing in the kitchen, a knife flew out of the, the knife block and stabbed one into one of the grapefruits and it flew right between them. Oh my gosh. And the only thing Stan could think about is everybody was freaked out. And he says, if it wanted to hurt us, it would have. It's one yeah. to scare. Yeah. yeah I mean, some of the, so many of these stories survive because the people survive, and it, it just makes you scratch your head because they sound so strange. They don't make any sense. Here's an interesting aside to that whole case. Uh, this was a business office, and they had had problems like this for years. Greams occurring, things moving, things, you know, all kinds of stuff happening. And they contacted medicine men who would come in and do a, a, a ceremony on the, on the place. And they said it would last for about three to four months. And so when this happened and Stan did the investigation, he was in Gallup and approached a uh, Baptist minister that was doing a tent meeting there. And he spoke to the minister about it and says, you know, is, is there anything that you know that we can do? And the minister told him, he says, yeah, he says, number one, take all the coins you have and throw them in a, in a fire that you made and burn them. So that's what Stan did. He collected them out of the ashes later on, and we have them today. The other thing he told them was that he knew how to do, oh, what do they call that? Like an the exorcism? Goes. Yeah. yeah. He says, I, he says, I've been trained to do an exorcism and I'll go building and do that. So that's what he did. The paranormal incidences stopped for about eight to nine months and slowly started to return, but they're not at the same hmm. Uh, level that they used to be is what we understand because we keep track of all all the people that we've done big major investigations for and so we recontacted them again and they said it's it's down in in the case of burning the the coins one of the people at stan's brother's house was sitting on a couch and he says well if they're going to throw coins these were pennies nickels dimes and quarters he said, if they're going to throw coins, you got to tell them to throw bills. <laughs> and he no longer, that no longer came out of his mouth and a wadded up bill flew through the air and hit somebody in the face. No way. That's... And when they opened it, it was a $1 bill. When they opened it up, it had the word die, D-I-E. And the E was in the shape of a pitchfork. What? So it definitely sounds demonic. Like, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. So when they burned everything, that was the last item that they threw in the fire. Of course, it was consumed. But Stan says that when they threw it in the fire, he says it was like if you took a couple of M80 uh, firecrackers and threw them in the fire and they exploded. Wow. He says ashes and coals and everything went all over the place wow. and burned the bottom of their pants and everything else. So he says uh, that, that was rather interesting uh, outcome for that for that bill. Dang, John! I, I, yeah, you have such a long career and you've seen so many things. What's the story that you that sort of you can't get out of your head or rattles you the most of all the things you've experienced? Well, uh, I get asked, uh, "What's the most unusual thing that's ever happened to you?" I've I've actually stood outside and videotaped UFOs flying around our our community here, but that isn't at the top. Most unusual incident I've had that I have no explanation for is every month, I, because I was averaging 5,000 miles a month, I would take my vehicle in to get serviced and I had to go to Tuba City from, from where I live. I know Luke. where Tuba City is. I've been there. Yeah. yeah. So that's where the, the fleet management is. So Loop, is uh, way down uh, 50 miles outside Flagstaff. 
So I would leave before daybreak. It's 45 miles to Kaikosmavi because you're driving so far, so many miles, you put your vehicle on cruise. And it's understood that if you're driving through the Hopi reservation, they are not a respecter of persons. If you're in a a police vehicle and you're speeding, they will stop you to find out why Mm. and probably write you a citation. So I'm towing the line. I'm doing 65 all the way up there and all the way across. So it's another 69 miles uh, to Tuba City. So 47, 69. And you're doing the speed limit the entire time. I've got this down so that I can leave the house at a certain time, get on the road. By the time I'm on 264, which is going through Hopi, the sun's just coming up. I'll get to Tuba City just a little bit before eight o'clock. I have time to go through a drive through restaurant and get a, a breakfast sandwich and a coffee and drive around and go sit at the gate to the fleet and my vehicle gets serviced first. So this is my normal routine. On this particular day, I'm driving through an area called Denebito Dam. And as I was driving through, I passed the dam. I'm going down the road. The sun is just, uh, it's what they call the false dawn where you're seeing a light on the horizon, but the sun isn't up yet. I looked in my, in, toward the front and I see miles and miles of straight highway. I look in my rear view mirror and I see miles and miles of straight highway behind me. And I blinked and all I can do is describe it as almost a physical slow motion blink where your eyes close and they open up immediately. And I'm suddenly coming to a sharp right hand turn. That right hand turn is just before you get to coal mine Mesa which is another 15 miles up that road from where I closed my eyes. Now, initially I thought, oh, I must have just zoned out and gone on autopilot. So I must have been sleep driving. But to get those 15 miles, you're going up and down hills, you're going around curves, and there's no way you can navigate all that with your eyes closed. So I go on and I'm, I'm just perplexed. And can't get it out of my mind. I get into Tuba City. I go through the drive through I'm, I'm the only one there. So I get right through. Go park at the uh, fleet management. And instead of being 10 minutes early, I'm 45 minutes early. Wow. And so I don't know how I gain 30 minutes of time. It's not physically possible, even if I was going over 100 miles an hour which my truck wouldn't do. Right. I've had people, when I talk about it, say, oh, you've, uh, uh, you were abducted and you were put down in the wrong time frame again. I've had people tell me that I went through the microscopic uh, event horizon of a black hole, uh, which uh, I, I find pretty hard to believe. Um, I have no idea. You know, I really don't. What's your best guess? Do you, th- you think it's like a little wormhole or a portal? You just kind of... Uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking portal, yeah. you know, but, uh, it's, it's just, that's strange. wild. Mm. Were you driving a DeLorean that day or was it the, uh, <laughs> the regular no, police I car? I think I was in a, uh, 2000 and 2001 Chevy pickup with a mm. bed cover on the back. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> no, no flux capacitor in that thing. Huh? Yeah. Right. It's strange. <laughs> yeah. The weirdest thing about that encounter is it doesn't sound like. It was a straight shot. If you're driving on a freeway, you go through a portal, and then all of a sudden you come out of it, and you're still going where you went. It sounds like you went through something, and then you know you go through like a rat maze, and you come out the other side. It doesn't, you know, wow. you, your idea of a portal is just like from one side to the other. That is just so strange. That's crazy. You time traveled as well because you can get there thirty. Yeah, yeah. That's I, I gained thirty minutes. That's yeah. Wild. Um, one of the things that, that me and Stan have speculated on for many years, all the way back, we started coming out with this in 2010, was that the only thing that ties everything together is this idea of dimensions and portals and gates. Mm. We are of the opinion that it accounts for ghost sightings, that these things are just popping in and out. We have this idea that a, a dimension is like a solid wall from here to another place. It's very possible that it could be like a cloud where the two are intermingling 
intermingling all the time. And that chance encounters of this type, such as the 411 missing cases, could be that you just happen to hit an entrance by accident. But some of these are, are more controlled and like uh, UFOs that are just popping into existence with a loud pop and then f- fading out as they go along. Hmm. In the case of hauntings, these could be just stretching over from other portals. And, and this idea of portals and dimensions is also carried out with the CERN Large Hadron Collider. One of their experiments was to open a dimensional gate and send a message through to the other side, which is kind of crazy because in military terms, they say never draw fire on your own position. Right. Uh, mm. So, you know, here we are waving the flag and say, you know, hey, here we are. Come get us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it just gets, yeah, it just gets weirder, John. The more and more we do this show and the more stories we hear. It just gets strange. And we, we think that, that these dimensions are keyed through frequencies. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing this in the Skinwalker Ranch episodes with the 1.6 gigahertz. Yeah. Ta- I've actually interviewed Skinwalkers uh, that have uh, come out of it. And they've described to me ceremonies where you're singing and humming kind of like a chant. And there's a certain frequency that you're trying to hit in order to affect these changes. And once the change occurs, you literally become this animal. But they said that the visual spectrum shifts to a redshift, which means that you can run incredibly fast and it gets blurry. So your acuum uh, for vision is, is not there, which I find real interesting. Super crazy. It does get blurry. That's awesome. Do you think that skinwalkers are aware when they turn into an animal or do they kind of have an out-of-body experience and they don't know what's going on and then they come back? It's, it's my conclusion that they are aware. They know what they're doing. They know where they're going. And there's a lot of stories about them that we've had. One of the ones that we feel is an important incident that happened is a family came to us and they said we had a, a run-in with one of these things and we were Coming home from me and, you know, the the husband and and the woman were coming home from from town. And as they drove in, they saw what they said was the coyote uh, that was trying to get into the sheep. And so the guy grabs the 22 out of the back of the truck uh, behind the seat and shoots it and hits it in the side. He says the coyote went down and was dragging its rear legs and it crawled into some tumbleweeds, but its hind legs were still sticking out. So he goes over there and he grabs it by the hind leg, got the, the leg in his left hand, he's got the rifle in the other hand, and he starts pulling it out so he could finish it off. And he says, as he's walking with it, this thing turned into a human leg in his hand. And he looked down and he saw a skinny, Navajo man that was painted white, almost like you took a a sponge with white paint and just dabbed it all over your body. Mm. And he says it was uh, dry and it was cracking everywhere. And his hair was painted the same color. He, he, all he had on was a loincloth and a bag Mm. and he dropped him immediately. And, you know, he's saying, what shall we do? What shall we do? You know? And, And the wife is saying, should we shoot it? Should we call an ambulance? You know? So they ended up calling the police. The police literally told them, we don't want anything to do with this. And when they came out, (laughs) so they called the ambulance. The ambulance showed up and the the attendants are Navajo. And they said, you know, but they loaded it up on the gurney and strapped it in and drove it into the town. Uh, Into the town, the ER staff that was Navajo was all chased out of the room. And the Anglo doctors saved this person. Wow. And so the family's question was, what do we do now? It, it, it knows who we are. Yeah. It knows we shot it. It's going to come back for revenge. And then, so we were talking to them for a while. And the wife happened to say, oh, and by the way, we noticed who it was. It was a community member that we, that we know. Huh. And uh, so we said, oh, well, that changes everything, you know. According to Navajo custom, if you know who it is and you go to their door and knock on it and tell them, confront them, within three days, that person will die. Wow. 
And we've actually seen this happen uh, in the past where people who were discovered to be shapeshifters uh, were somehow confronted either by family members or by other people. And suddenly they, they passed away. Mm. It's wild. So you, get, you get named three days and you're yeah, three days. John, what do you, what do you say to skeptical people? I'm one of my last questions for you. You know, a lot of people just write off. These are, these are native American stories. Native Americans think a certain way and there's no credibility to them. You know, obviously people removed from the culture, removed from the res. Most people live in cities and they, and they think the world operates exactly like they're told. And they hear stuff like this and they just scratch their head and they're like, well, you know, they just have their simple answers. I mean, what do you, I'm sure you get a lot of skeptical people over the, over the years, or maybe you avoid them, you know, but. <laughs> well, Navajos have what they call a verbal tradition. These information is handed down generation to generation through medicine men and through uh, people, elders within the tribe. When you talk about Navajo knowledge, the songs that are taught to Navajo men for ceremonies, say enemy way ceremony, which is three nights, has to, there, there's over 240 songs that are sung over three nights. Each one has to be sung exactly because if you mess one up or put it in the wrong order or mess up the words, the whole ceremony is negated. Mm. So because of this oral tradition, things are repeated accurately. Mm. Navajo language is incredibly precise language. It lacks the nuance that English has where you can, you can make a double entendre with a word right, you know, and, right. and, and has several different meanings. Navajo isn't like that. So you have this oral tradition. In the case of this old man case, he was approached over four years, three different interviews, and we compared the interviews side by side. He never added to them hmm. uh, and embellished them. He never took away from any of them. He said them exactly the same as it happened to him. So uh, that lends a lot of credibility. Uh, the other thing that we're told is that Indians or Native Americans are savages. The definition of savage in the Anglo context is somebody who does not have a written language, period. So we had an oral language and that was precise, but it doesn't qualify because, you know, we were not the winners. And so they took us off the reservations uh, to teach us in boarding schools and beat the Indian out of the, out of the native because there was a Christian just waiting to come out. So Indians were punished for speaking their language. They were punished for having long hair, which was their tradition. Mm. And they were molded to be, uh, this was the idea of assimilation, that uh, native tribes would cease to exist and the government thereafter could take over the lands. That didn't happen. The United States is not a melting pot. The United States is a stew pot where you have groups of Italians and you have groups of Armenians and you have groups of Germans all living together, mm -hmm. groups of French people and different tribes that are still corporal, mm -hmm. you know, that, that are still together. Mm -hmm. So that didn't work. And we're still here. We yeah. still survived. John, I've got I've got one last question too. Why in why do you surmise that, that there seems to be so much activity on on reservations, particularly because we hear about these kind of things, like you know whether it be UFO or in this case like the Skinwalker phenomena, or there seems to be a lot of activity centered around reservations. And it, it, from someone who worked for 30 years on a Nav as a Navajo Ranger, I would love just to, your thoughts on maybe why, I know things happen everywhere. I'm not, I'm not saying that's the only place that happens. Not, that's not my, my intent at all. Just it seems there'd be some concentration of things oftentimes on, on res reservation land. Well, uh, the, the, the Navajos along with Hopis and a lot of other Indian tribes across the United States and First Nations up in Canada have this history that says that the uh, gods came to them early on it imparted knowledge hmm. and so they designed kachinas to look like these gods they designed yebaches to look like these gods and perform ceremonies to remember them mm -hmm. so there's more of an open thought process when it comes to this 
uh, we've asked people on Navajo, why don't you report these to MUFON? Because they're the clearinghouse for all this information. And they tell us if we notify people, they will come up here, they'll all hold hands, sing kumbaya, stand in a circle, and these things will not come back to us. So we're chasing the gods away. The other thing that I found out is that when you live up here, there's not much electricity, just the major cities and towns have them and some rural electrification product. So we have a full view of the starscape up there. Things are more noticeable. If you go into the city, you have light pollution. You know, unfortunately, Los Angeles, Sacramento, you go outside, you might see one or two, you know, stars Mm -hmm. and everything else is just grayed out. So you don't have the same vision Mm -hmm. that they do out here. I think things are happening all the time. We're just not aware of them or we choose to willfully ignore them. Whereas with Navajos, there's always some other reason that they're happening. And you need to find out what that reason is and protect yourself if you need protecting. That's awesome. That's a good, that's a good word. I mean, you think that, yeah, like, I mean, I, this is crazy, but like I have a neighbor who said that, his neighbor, and this is my neighborhood, his neighbor across the street seen these two cigar-shaped UFOs above our neighborhood skyline during the day. And it's crazy because yeah. I don't think to look up. I mean, I don't live in this, I live outside the city, but not in the city, but we still have the ability, you know, we still have the light pollution here. And I, I think they make a good point that like people aren't looking. And then the things that we do you know, with electricity, especially in the lights, they it seems to cloud out some of the phenomena that maybe we would see if we were looking for it, right? Or just looking in general. That's it's an interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you have to be kind of trained to see some of these things. You know, you have to be made aware of it. And from people who listen to our show, it seems like they have some experience their grandma had or their mom had. Or if you don't grow up with people talking about these stories, that the world is the world is spiritual, whether you whether you accept it or not. If you don't hear those things at, at a young age, it gets harder and harder as you get older to see it. But obviously, it sounds like. You know, at a young age on the res, you, you're hearing stories. Like you were saying, you know, older people are, are treated with respect and they're, they're sharing their stories and their encounters. And the world, the cosmology, everything is different. And you, you quickly learn the world is not how you think it is. It's definitely not how we're told either. The, the world is much more interesting than we give it credit yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. It's funny because, like, <laughs> people... People who hate our show, who don't like our show, say that the world isn't as crazy as we make it sound on the podcast. But it's it's funny. It's like some people just, they knee jerk to all this, the blurry things out there in the shadows. And it's cool that you've had all these experiences all these years. Thanks for coming on our show. Yeah, and, thank you, John. Yeah. And dropping story after story to make a little bit more sense of what we've heard in in previous episodes we've touched a lot of these subjects but everyone you know brings a little bit more of their their own flavor to the uh to the stories we've heard before and it just kind of you know i think i think the more you listen to our catalog the more you start to go okay i make a little bit more sense of things how could people listeners follow your work get involved with you do you have a youtube channel or a podcast or yeah, well, just... if you if if you look at uh, if you Google Navajo Rangers, or if you look up on YouTube Navajo Rangers, you'll see a lot of our our uh, talks that we've done, our yeah. our conventions and stuff, and and you'll get more stories that way. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks, John. Yeah, John, thank we, uh... you. Thanks for part two. Uh, sorry about the first yeah. time around. <laughs> yeah, the first well, one went through we'll a keep portal. Our fingers crossed. Yeah, right. I mean, hey, we'll, we'll have a. We'll know each other real well if this thing goes south here, but um, yeah, I think we did enough recording that we'll make it happen. But thank yeah. you for, yeah, thank you yeah. for your for your stories and your time. Just thank you for your time today. Sure thing. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And if and if money dollar bills start coming out of the out of the the walls and hitting you, Luke, you got to let me send know. them my way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm right. retired now, yeah. so I'm on a limited <laughs> income. As long as they don't say anything nefarious, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Podcasting, right? That's the yeah. only way you, you can make it. If all of a sudden money yes. just starts popping out of the out of the portals, do a show like this, it might happen. Yep. You well, never we're, know. We're we're gonna go back through those coins and see if there's any uh, value valuable yeah. uh, valuable ones in there from from the the past. Yeah, awesome. So wild, so bizarre. Well, if you have if you hear anything or anything crazy happens, John, you're always welcome on our show. Thanks yeah, for 
Thank coming you. on, and I love it. Sure thing. All right, bro. All right. Until next you. time.